uh, our big outreach of the year in which we get into communities uh, in a special way, uh, food. Anybody got a problem with food today? Okay, if you do, this church is not for you, just so you understand. Listen, Halloween Zones is right around the corner. It's crazy, but it's right around the corner, and we need your help. If you're new to Church of Celebration, it's simple. We actually just hold these like little barbecues inside our driveways and invite people to church. How simple is that? On on Halloween night, and it's very, very simple. We've had uh, 30 to 40 to I think close to 50 before, but we need your help. Inside your programs today is an incredible way that you can sign up to just give candy, to give hot dogs, to bring water, to host, to host an actual driveway Halloweeny zone. Um, we would love to have you become a part of that. So please fill out that pro uh, that little insert sheet. Or you can text 555-888. Taxes and fees may apply, okay? You can text that and you can get some more information, but please. And as you saw out, candy's huge. Candy is huge. If you're like, I don't want to host a home, but you want to give candy, we will take it. We, we every year try to fill up the van so we can supply um, these houses that are host homes with some candy to do that. So you guys ready for Halloween Zones? I'll be here in a minute. That's awesome. Welcome again. If you're a guest of ours, man, thanks for choosing to worship with us today. We're super glad that you're here. We're moving into the second week of a series that we started last week called My Big Fat Mouth. And I'm excited because our, because our junior hires and our senior hires have been in this series. This is one of those series in which they just don't do youth during these four weeks. So junior hires, are you in here? Can I get a what what from you? All right, all right, they're a little, hey, you know what, they're really, really confident to pop off to you and mom and dad, right? But when I give them a little, you know, mic time, they're like, oh, uh, right, that's junior hires. So it should create for some awesome conversation for you uh, as parents. So here's what we're really after in this series. You can follow along also in your Bible apps, uh, the notes and, and verses, but I think I just think this, this is the reason we're doing this series. I think that we all could do a better job at understanding um, what we say and how we speak can affect others. Can I get an amen on that one? I mean, the reality is, is let's just face the facts. Your words, my words, have the, have the power to give life to somebody. But on the same side of things, it, it also has your words and my words have the power to take life. The Bible is very specific that our tongues, that our mouths are very, very dangerous things like fire, like, like swords. And, and, and it, it can do some serious damage in people's lives. And last week we talked about our first area that, that many of us um, struggle with in the area with our big fat mouths. And that was with complaining. Complaining. And basically we said kind of this as in a nutshell that complaining is when you basically Take your eyes off of the goodness of God and place them dead center on yourself. That is a dangerous thing to do. And, and we said a couple things about complaining to give you some kind of, uh, you know, encouragement. Because here's the deal. All of us could get better. All of us could get better at what we say to others. Right? Right? Ladies, feel free to just elbow your husband big time on that one. Um, we could all get better. So we said this about complaining. If there is something in your life or someone in your life that you, you don't like the circumstances you're in, you have a choice to make. You have a choice to make with those things or people or circumstances in your life when it comes to whether or not you will complain or not. If you can do something about it, then do it and stop complaining. See, most of us complain about things that we could actually change. And I don't get that, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. But I, I do get that there's some of us are in situations or circumstances with people that we can't change the situation or the person or the circumstances. And if you can't do that, then here's what you need to do. You need to change in how you view it. Your perspective needs to change. And you need to do that and stop complaining. So that's... That's the, the idea that we talked about. Now, a good way of helping you from complaining, and I, maybe you did this this past week or, or, or not, 
But when you were tempted to complain, anybody here complain last week, even after last week's message? Yeah, look at there. The rest of the room doesn't know Jesus. Yes. <laughs> it is to remind yourself with what you're about ready to complain against. Because remember, I said, you, you take your eyes off of God and put them on yourself. So what you're complaining about is, is something that you don't like, even though that God may have allowed that in your life. You need to remind yourself that you're not the center of your story. Remember, once you gave your life to Jesus Christ, God has become the center of your story. And you need to remind yourself that when it comes to complaining. Now, this week we're moving into criticizing. I'm once again preaching under protest. Okay? Because I am a very sarcastic person. Don't you dare say amen. And here's what I've learned as I prepare this message. Oh my gosh, this is me. Because I'm not necessarily just like outright and you like, oh my gosh, here comes a very critical person. You might say, oh my gosh, here comes a very sarcastic person. And here's what I've learned is kind of, I've uncovered some things. Sarcasm is nothing more than criticism disguised in humor. So, I am putting myself on the altar this morning and telling you I'm preaching under protest. So don't you dare come through the line and say, that'll preach, PJ, with this point or that point, okay? Because I will hear it enough later today with Ginger, just trust me. We're going to talk about criticizing today, then next week we're going to talk about lying, then, next, then the, the last week we're going to talk about gossiping, and as I said last week, if you're not here the last week, we're going to talk about you. So, when we're talking about criticism, it's really important that from the beginning you know that we are not talking about constructive criticism. We're not talking about that constructive feedback that you tend to give towards people that you care about um, because you want to help make them better. See, moms and dads, you need to pay attention because the teenagers are in the room today. You need to understand that, that you disguise your criticism sometimes with constructive criticism. And when you are constantly being critical of your children because they're just so dumb, by the way, they are dumb. The Bible says they're dumb. Okay? Bound in the heart of a child is folly. They're fools, okay? Just so you understand. You're disguising your criticism, your critical spirit with constructive criticism. And if you do that enough, you have crossed the threshold. You have moved beyond constructive, and you are just downright critical. And you are wondering why you have a tough relationship with your kids sometimes. Because all they're ever hearing you is not constructively criticizing them. All they're ever hearing you say is what they're doing wrong. So th this is dangerous territory. And you got to know from the gate that moms and dads, I'm, I, I stand in front of the line. We, we, we often move from constructive criticism to being nitpicking, to being unkind, to being uninformed. And, and it just moves into being cruel sometimes with our criticism. And that's the criticism that we're talking about today. So, so we need to be very careful with this. And I know you don't know anybody, you know, or this, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. You, you don't do this, but you know of somebody that does. Feel, feel free to point to them if you, if you want right now. Um, but in all seriousness, even with that last comment that I made, even though it's joking, I know you because I know me, right? That there are a lot of times that we'll come to church and we'll hear a message on a topic and we'll think, oh my gosh, so-and-so needs to hear that message. Or I wish so-and-so was here. Or you're going to go home and you're going to send the link of today's live feed to them. <laughs> All seriousness, let me remind you what the series title is. My Big Fat Mouth. Not their bag, their big fat mouth, okay? So, so really, really pay attention to this. Now, the primary reason or the primary problem with criticism in all of us 
is it's just really difficult because sometimes you're like, I'm not that critical. Well, I think there's a tendency in all of us to be critical. And the hardest part is, is it's really difficult for us to look in the mirror and see ourselves for what we are. And, and here's how we know. We all, we all really hate when, when, when other people criticize us. It bothers us when people are criticizing us. So we don't often realize when we're the ones actually doing the criticizing. We, we, we often feel justified in criticizing the other person who feels uh, who we feel like they need to be criticized. And it's very difficult to do this. Because here's, let, let's, let's face the facts. When the last person or thing that you were critical towards, this is what you're thinking in your brain. And again, th- these are my words, okay? I'm on the table today. This is the way that my brain thinks sarcastically, critically. If they just weren't so dang weird. If they weren't just so stupid. If they wouldn't just keep spending their money so unwisely, then I wouldn't have to criticize them. Because after all, if we're just being honest today, I know what's best for them more than they do. So how that kind of sounds might be played out like this in your conversation. It may not have actually happened this way, but it kind of really is. So listen, friend, I I get that God has a wonderful plan for you. Son, daughter of mine, God has a wonderful plan for you. But it's important that you know, so do I. And if you don't start living up to my plan for your life, by the way, how stupid does that sound? Well, then I'm just going to have to keep criticizing the way that you're raising your kids or the way that you choose to dress or the way that you keep posting things on Facebook, Insta, Finsta, Twitter, Snapchat. If you don't start doing things the way that I think you should do and, and start driving the way that I think you should drive, or where you went on your last vacation, because I know that you're in debt up to your eyeballs and you can't afford that. Is it getting a little quiet in here today? So here's, here's what I want to do for starters today. I want to start by sharing a very popular verse in the Bible. If you've grown up in church, you've probably heard this verse before. Even if you haven't grown up in church, you've probably heard this verse in some way, shape, or form. However, I'd be willing to bet that more than half of you don't know what the second verse that follows this verse actually says, which is very important because it doesn't seem as popular as the one that everybody wants to use. Galatians chapter 5, 14, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the uh, uh, Christians, the church in Galatia, and he says this. This is the popular verse, ready? For the whole law can be summed up with this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Ever heard that before? Raise your hand. Yeah, look at look around. And most of us have heard that because it's very, very famous and we love it. But here's the not so famous part. The very next verse says this. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Be very careful, Paul says. Beware of destroying one another. See, Paul knew we all have a tendency to be critical. Paul says, this is the way you should treat one another. And everybody's like, I like that one. Sign me up, man. That's warm and fuzzy. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, then Paul, in the very same breath, says, but you need to be careful, man. You need to watch out because all you ever seem to be doing is biting and devouring one another. And do you know when you keep biting somebody and devouring them, you're actually going to eventually destroy them. Destroy them. If your words are constantly critical, if you're always cutting into people, if you're always harsh with your words, you need to get this. Criticism is what destroys one another. So let me propose a thought today for you to strongly consider. What if? What if husband and wife 
husband or wife, your critical words are actually destroying the potential intimacy that you could have for your marriage. What if mom or dad out there today, your critical words are actually driving a wedge in between you and your child? What if teenager, listen to me, because you just like in that last one, like, amen, that's the first time you ever said anything out loud in church. What if teenager, your critical words towards your mom and dad are actually roadblocking the undeniable wisdom that your parents have for you in your life? Or worse yet, what if, Christian, follower of Jesus today, your critical words are actually keeping you from sharing the goodness of Jesus with somebody in your life that needs to know him because you just can't stop being critical of anything and everything in, your li in their lives. See, th this is dangerous territories for a follower of Jesus. We, we, we want to preach, preach, preach truth to that sinner. And we want to tell them what you're doing is wrong. Now let, let me just be very clear. What they're doing, it may be wrong. But can I just remind you today, they are a sinner, they are separated from Jesus, and they don't know what they're doing is wrong. So how is your criticism going to ever draw them in to being able to let Jesus show them what they're doing is wrong? Who gave you the right to play God in their life? You're actually pushing people away. So Paul basically says this when it comes to criticizing, watch out, be careful. Be very, very careful that your words don't end up hurting or destroying those around you. So, with that little warning out of the way today, let me share with you a couple verses that have, uh, are known in Scripture as, as contrasting verses. There's tons of contrasting verses all throughout Scripture. And basically, contrasting verses are this. Um, they basically mean when a verse says one thing about the subject, and then it says something completely opposite about the, sub, the very same subject. So it's like contrasting things. Like it could be good and bad, but, but this is what a contrasting verse is. Here's one, for example, and it, and it makes perfect sense with our, with our uh, topic today. Proverbs 12, 18 says this. Some people make cutting remarks. But the words of the wise bring healing. So basically, that is meaning exactly kind of what it says, but it's contrasting. It says some people use their words to cut, to hurt, to criticize. But there's other people that actually build up, they don't tear down, and they create healing. Paul actually talked about this very same idea uh, in another way, in his letter to the Christians at Ephesus, in, in Ephesians chapter 429, he said this. Don't use foul or abusive language. We've used that one with our kids when we hear them learn something, a cuss word at school, right? But, but go further. Don't just like use that as like, you know, a brow beater on them. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say, is that a, let, let some things you say? Every once in a while, when you say something, let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. In other words, here's what Paul is saying. Don't let unhelpful and unwholesome and impure and critical words come from your mouth. Stop tearing each other down and let the only words that you speak be words that are helpful that are supportive that are building others up according to their needs how is that going for you and your teenagers if i were to interview your teenage son today dad and I would say, hey, what do you know your dad more for? 
encouraging, uplifting, or cutting? My son would say, Dad's sarcastic. I know, John, shut up, dude. <laughs> Listen. And here's the thing. Because I could pull my wife up and I could say, Ginge, would you list everything that I do for my son that is good, helpful, and supportive? And that list... I promise you, would far outnumber the amount of sarcastic, cutting <laughs> remarks that I make towards my son. But what does my son remember most? What I'm really hoping you're getting today is you have no idea. How a single word of criticism can literally pierce the heart of someone's soul. That literally, it's time in their lives. Your words have power. Have we said that yet in this series? The power to give life and the power to take life. And I just think. Because I'm at the front of the line, there are some people in this room that need to do some serious analyzing and evaluating and decide today whether they want to keep using their words to be a life taker or they want to choose to use their words to be a life giver. So the, bot, the, the big question today is, is this, what, what, kind, what kind of person do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? And literally, with that, there really only two choices when it comes to criticism. Here's the first option that you have when it comes to criticism and answering that question. Evaluation. Am I this person or am I option two, which we'll get to in a minute. Here's your first option. You can definitely be a fault finder. You can be a fault finder. It's easy, easy to do. Matter of fact... I believe that there's more fault finders than there are of the second option, which I'll get to in a minute. This is what most people are today. They are fault finders. And that is primarily, friends, because of our sinful nature. Our sin nature, all of us, we, we just have this tendency to look for what's wrong before we ever get around to looking for what's right. It's in all of us. And I know that hurts a little bit, but that's truth. Naturally, this is what it is. We, we base everything in life of what's wrong and what's right. This is a trend in all of us. For example, marriage. Marriage, I have seen this countless times as a pastor. You can take a relatively good person and completely pick them apart before you even pass your first year of marriage. I have sat in premarital counseling sessions where people are gaga and goo goo over enough, one another. And a year or two years later, they are in my same office, on my same couch, telling me about how they don't like how that person talks. They don't like how that person walks. They don't like how that person chews. They don't like the jokes they tell. They don't even like how they breathe. And those are the very same things that made them fall in love with each other. How about another example? Within six months, you are saying this. I don't like how my boss talks. I don't like the how my boss runs meetings. I don't like the strategic plan that my boss has laid out. I don't like the fact that my boss actually expects me to do any work. Take your pick, friends. We're all good at this. She says she loves Jesus, but can you believe what she posted on Facebook the other day? This is the stupidest place I've ever been. Teenagers, don't miss this one. Can you believe, can you believe the snap crack post that he just posted the other day? I wonder what's on his mind. No, this is a good one. No, I'm not judging. I'm just saying.
can you believe the way they raise their kids? If they keep doing that the same way, they might as well put them in prison now. Did you see how Pastor Matt was driving the other day in the COC van? Here's my point. It is really easy to be a fault finder. If you're a fault finder, you're a lot like the Pharisees in the Bible. They were really, really good fault finders. And don't miss this one because this is going to sting a little bit. You're not only like the Pharisees. You're also a lot like the devil. Because the Bible tells us that he is a deceiver. A devourer. The prince of darkness. The father of lies. He's also referred to as, get get this, the accuser. Who is constantly accusing people before God day and out. And do you know what accusing people is? It is finding fault in them. Constantly criticizing them. Satan is the master fault finder. There's actually a few reasons that we lean towards fault finding. Maybe maybe this is you. I, I don't know. But the primary reason that we lean towards fault finding is just general pride. We just, we just think we know what's best for them. Pride. I know better than you. You might as well just tell that person that you constantly are criticizing because you were pride today. I know more than you, idiot. That's what you're doing. Another reason that you lean towards fault finding is insecurity. Insecurity. We, 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 when we criticize others, we, we often criticize the very areas that we're weak in ourselves. And this last reason, this is a lot of us. This is a lot of us that we lean towards fault finding. Just general misunderstanding. We often criticize from a distance things that we know nothing about. Oh gosh, do you know how good we're at this? How about this, for example? Parenting versus criticizing other people's parenting tactics. Do you remember back when, you know, before you had kids of your own? How easy it was for you to criticize the various moms and dads that you would see out in public. Right? How in the world could they let their two-year-old act like that with that type of behavior in the grocery store? Can you believe the audacity and lack of parenting skills? Sheesh. But that's because, guess what, friends? You didn't have context. What's context, Pastor Josh? You didn't have kids of your own. But now you have context. And you have kids of your own. And you know that it is strategically impossible to negotiate with terrorists. I mean kids. (laughs) Especially in public. I, I really do believe. That a lot of us, a lot of our criticism is the result of a serious case of misunderstanding. I just do. It's easier for me to criticize what you're doing from a distance than for me to actually take the time to find out what, what actually is going on. When we criticize others, we tend to be, uh, think that criticizing actually makes us look smarter. In some way, shape, or form. But the truth is it actually makes us look the actual, uh, the actual opposite. It makes us look insecure and mean, mean-spirited. Be- before I move on, let me just make my point with this one, fault finding, out of the gate. Okay? Have you ever met a critical person that you want to be like? Man, if I could just grow up and be like that person. They're so awesome at criticizing people. (laughs) You can be a fault finder. What kind of person do you want to be? Or you could be a hope dealer. 
a hope dealer. This is what scripture says about hope dealers. Okay, I didn't say dope dealers, I said hope dealers. <laughs> Some of you. This is, that's the junior high boys out there. Did he just say dope dealer? <laughs> yeah, I said dope dealer. Okay, Romans, I just was critical. Gosh dang it. Here's what scripture says about hope dealers. Shut up! I told you! I didn't want to preach this message! And I mean that with all the love of Jesus Christ because I'm a hope dealer. This is what scripture says about hope dealers. Romans 15, 13. I pray that God Pay attention to this next part. Who is the source of hope? Wow. Will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Guys, go read the writings of the Apostle Paul. Dude was a hope dealer, man. Over and over and over. Listen to the power of those words. I pray that God, the source of hope, would fill you with complete joy and peace as you trust in him. Anytime that you would, you would hear Paul speak, anytime that, that, that Paul would write, he was not tearing people down. He was building people up at all times. Here are some of the Romans 8. Romans 8 highlights, hope highlights is what I call them. Now uh, now therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Pray, that's hope, man. That is hope, the Holy Spirit. He's the one that helps you in your weakness. Jesus, gosh, this is hopeful. Jesus is right now making intercession at the right hand of God the Father on your behalf right now. You, you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Are you kidding me? Wow. No, 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 nothing can separate you from the love of God. Not death, not height, not demons, not angels, not powers or present, future, height or depth. Anything in all of creation can separate you no no what incredible incredible words of hope now you can clap seriously what what kind of person do you want to be you want to be a fault finder you want to be a hope dealer just consider a few things that Jesus referred to throughout scripture and ask yourself do I want to be more like the devil The master fault finder, do I want to be more like Jesus, who is the master hope dealer? Here's a few things that you need to know about the hope dealer today. He's the bread of life. He's living water. He's the good shepherd. He's the door. He's the living vine. He's the gate. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the alpha and omega. First Timothy re- refers to Jesus as our hope. Titus refers to him as our blessed hope. When someone would sin in the Bible, the Pharisees would be the ones that would point out the sin and they would accuse. But look at what Jesus did. He would come in and he would call sin for what it was. And then what would Jesus do? He offered hope. Hope. To walk away from the bondage of sin. What kind of person do you want to be? A fault finder? Or a hope dealer? Listen friends, the closer, this this is what happens. Sometimes like I'm really trying to get close to Jesus. And it's just not easy. (laughs) No. That's why most people stop and they're just like, this is just too much to read my Bible every day. Do you know why it's really, really hard to grow closer to God in your walk with him? And why you seem to be so inconsistent in your walk with him? Because the closer you are to God, the more aware you are of your sinfulness. But the more you are aware of your sinfulness... Here's what happens. You just don't stick with it and stay with it long enough. The more you are aware of your sinfulness... 
the more God will show you and make you aware of the magnitude of his grace. All because of what he's done for you and who he is for you. Matthew 7, 1 through 5a. Powerful word on fault finding, on criticizing. It says, do not judge or you too will be judged. By, by the way, this passage is sometimes taken out of context. Je Jesus in this particular passage is not talking about assessing behavior. Okay, which we use today as our defense with this verse. He's actually talking about maligning motives. He says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be used to measure you. So he says, what, why? Why in the world do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that's sticking out of your own eye? How can you actually say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there, there's a plank coming out of yours? Strong words, ready? You hypocrite. Wait a minute. Are we now being called hypocrites if we're being critical in our lives? Guess so. Here's what I've learned a lot in ministry. People who lean towards being hypercritical are usually very hypocritical. I did, hate to point out negative side, but how many preachers, famous preachers, have pointed out the sins of another pastor that have fallen and then six months later they fall? And that's on a larger scale that we can see, but it happens in all of our lives. How can you be critical of someone else's marriage when you go home and don't even sleep in the same bed with your husband or your wife? First take out the plank out of your own eye, and then guess what? You'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. In other words, I believe this is what Jesus is saying here to those of us that seem to be hypercritical. You need to put down your magnifying glass and you need to pick up a mirror. If you're a follower of Jesus today, let me remind you of who you are. You are a people of God, which means you are a hope dealer. You point people to Jesus, who is the King of Kings. You are a hope dealer. You point people to Jesus, the only one who can forgive them from their brokenness. You are a hope dealer. You point people to Jesus, the only one who can restore righteousness. You are a hope dealer. Dealer, you point people to Jesus who is your savior, your king, your Lord, your hope, because you are a hope dealer. You are a hope dealer. You are a hope dealer. And trust me, I know the minute I become sarcastic today, my wife is going to get up and say, you are a hope dealer. I get it. I get it. You point people to hope. You point people to hope. You point people to hope. Because that's what you do. Because that's who you are. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Everybody stand with me today. Please don't cut me off and please don't leave. Snipers up in the rafters. Take your trank guns off of safety and get ready to nail anybody. All heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Brother, sister, and Jesus, today, listen, what kind of person do you want to be? You want to be a fault finder? 
You want to be a hope dealer. With all heads and, 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 and uh, bowed and eyes closed today, let, let me just ask a simple question today. It's going to take courage and honesty for you to answer. But how many of you out there right now would have the courage and honesty to raise your hands to this? You know what, Josh? I do tend to be a little more critical. At times, I am a little more harsh. I can be known at times to tear people down. And it's usually those that I love the most. My wife, my husband, my kids, my coworkers, my classmates. I can tear people down in society, in culture, and politics with the best of them and hide behind it online. I sometimes lean towards being critical, towards fault finding, a little more than I do towards hope dealing. Is there anybody willing to raise your hand and say, that's me, that's, that's me. I, I can be that way. Raise your hand up. Raise your hand up. Keep it up. You know, you know uh, here's what's sad to me. And this is not meant to be demeaning, but every single person's hand should be raised at this time. Because I doubt that any of us made it through this past week without being critical in some way, shape, or form. I want to thank you for your honesty. You can put your hands down. That is amazing. That is awesome. And I appreciate your courage today. Let me challenge you to do something today. When we sing this last song... That person or people that you are very critical to, towards, they may be here today. They may be standing beside you today. I'm going to challenge you today for you to grab them and say, can we go forward? Because I want to confess, not only to you today, son, not only to you today, daughter, not only to you today, husband, not only to you today, wife, but I want to confess in front of you to God that I've been a little bit more of a fault finder than a hope dealer in your life. And I'm asking you for forgiveness today and I'm gonna ask God for forgiveness. Would you have the courage in a minute when we sing this song to come forward, hit your knees with that person if they are with you today. And if they're not with you, I wanna challenge you to still come forward and ask God to show you ways that you can be more of a hope dealer to that person or people in your life that you tend to be a little more critical towards. Lastly, to the most important people in this room. <laughs> Those of you that don't know Jesus Christ as your personal savior. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. But you've been living your life feeling as if somebody has been really critical of it. Time and time and time again. And yes they have. His name is Satan. And he's relentless. And he continues over and over to put you down, to put you down, put you down. And if you're out there today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, can I offer you a little hope today? Let me say this first and foremost. Regardless of the thoughts that are swirling around in your brain and the constant attack from Satan accusing you and being critical of you or your life, you, friend, are not pathetic. You are not a loser. You are not someone who can never get it right. You, my friend, are loved by the awesome love of Jesus Christ. And he is here today ready to offer you hope. And if that is you today, friend, and you don't know him and you're tired of feeling as if you are, you are the worst person in the world, can I give you a little hope today and invite you forward to meet Jesus? Christ. We've got some incredible friends that'll be down at the front with lanyards. There are What's Next counselors. They would be thrilled. They would go home today and celebrate that they had a chance to introduce you to Jesus Christ. I promise you. I promise you they would. So during this next song, if that's you today and you're tired of feeling the way that you're feeling, would you come forward as well? My prayer for this particular message has been that the altars are full. Because all of us could learn a little bit more being less of a fault finder and more of a hope dealer. Jesus, thank you for today. I'm praying, Lord, that somebody would respond today. I pray that somebody would come into a personal relationship with you for the first time. Today is a perfect day to do that. Help us, Jesus, 
I know, I know this message and the words from, from your scripture spoke and penetrated somebody's heart today because they ripped me to shreds in preparation. I had, I'm, I'm so glad I had to... I wrote this three weeks ago to try to make some things right, and I still didn't make a ton of headway. Don't say amen, Ginger. But I had to get my heart to a place in which I could, I could somewhat deliver this. But God, you're showing me ways. That, that's what I'm grateful for. You've been showing me ways, and you've just like been dinging in my ear. Josh, was that dealing hope, or was that, you know, finding fault? trying but it's a daily battle it's a daily grind and i know that is for somebody so give them the courage to come as well we love you jesus in your precious and your holy 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 son's name amen come forward right now right now just come forward and get it right let's do it